Hey guys, welcome back to the show. We have a presentation for you today. Values in therapy, a debate, a philosophical debate that has gone on since the dawn of humanity, various iterations, but it's coming up now in our culture It values in therapy. What values do we need to achieve to grow, like, to, to grow yeah, psychologically? So if you go to therapy, say you're some guy going to therapy, are there fundamental values there that you need to follow and achieve for your life in order to grow and mature in the healthy way? Or do we go to therapy to determine our own values? Is it enough to do what you feel we could say? Or do you need to do what's so-called correct or right? A couple weeks ago, I talked about affirmations. And the ultimate affirmations are, aren't really affirmations so much, but questions. you got to get really clear about what you avoid and what you need. Um and then once you once you start to get good, good at answering those questions in, in a clear way and not just avoid what you think you're avoiding or face what you think you're avoiding, but face what you ultimately avoid in your life, same thing with your needs. Are you trying to achieve what you really need or are these needs just there to cover up some pain in your life? Once you get really good at distinguishing that, at discerning the answers in those questions, then you ultimately, I think that the best affirmation is... Uh, the next right thing, or what is the next right thing, which I guess is also in uh, Frozen 2, which I can't imagine can't imagine how lame Frozen 2 is because Frozen 1 was lame enough, but that may be an indication of where we're going here. Even a lame movie may give, uh, may, there may be profound wisdom, we could say, in a lame movie uh, like Frozen 2, which is, yeah, that's an indication, sure. Okay, so animusempire.com slash schedule... We do free consultations, so I just want to say that this pre or a lot of the stuff for this presentation was originally in my book, but I took it out because it, it was just too philosophical, and I, I think it distracted from the main point of the book, which was psychology, not so much philosophy, but the part that I did leave in from this presentation in the book was about uh, healthy needs versus unhealthy needs. More indication of where we're going here in this presentation. So outlined for you, part one context for this debate like i said has been waged rage has been raging on and both sides have been waging war against each other whatever uh for a long time so there's a context and there's philosophical background and part three man's nature how does man's nature play into values we'll talk about it part four intention and then part five practice there's gonna be a lot of heady abstract topics here it's gonna be it's gonna get quite conceptual let's say but I think uh, we'll break it down at the end of some actionable advice. Actionable. That's how you know when advice is not going to be actionable when somebody says it's actionable. Okay. So part one is context for this debate. So the discrepancy here, I guess just to go over what I uh, talked about in the first slide is, do we go over, or do we go to therapy to receive wisdom or do we go to therapy to develop our own wisdom? Is the therapist this guy who's this bastion, this beacon of wisdom, and he's like a, a Rolodex. <laughs> we go through the Rolodex of his wisdom. Nobody knows what a Rolodex is anymore, but do we go through the Rolodex of his wisdom to, to find out what applies to our life? And we take his wisdom, kind of put it in our brain and apply it to our life, or do we go to therapy to develop our own wisdom? Now, the way of saying this, this goes to the philosophical debate, is are there objective values or values only subjective? And if values are objective, how do we determine what those values are? If, I guess if you listen to more than two and a half seconds of any of my videos, you're going to know that the question of, or, or the debate between objective and subjective, well, it's both half right and it's both half wrong. I, I guess the a way, a way of framing this is, you know, what's the most annoying question that therapists ask? Or, yeah, when you ask a therapist, Hey, so what should I do in this situation? The most annoying question that he asks is, well, I don't know. What do you think you should do, right? I mean, that's annoying. And the answer to this discrepancy is on what basis, on what context does he ask you that question back? What do you think you should do? Does he just ask you that? out of Like, what do you feel like you should do in this situation? And is that enough? Or does he ask you that question based on who you are, how, where the discussion and therapy has gone up until that point, and who you are is based on, in fact, what you are, your nature. So 
Well, the way that this debate iterates now is with this kind of therapist, right? Like the social justice, critical theory, feminist, um, anti-patriarchy, uh, you know, race theorist kind of, you know, however you want to say that kind of therapist. And this kind of therapist, you know, pink hair, giving you that look, you know, the she, they, I think you could write volumes about the look that this lady gives in this picture. Like, what is, what is she trying to communicate? Anyway, um, she knows what's wrong with you. Right? When you go to a therapy and you get a therapist like this, which, you know, side note, not not to complain about this too much, but you're not going to find too many therapists younger than 40 who aren't fully, they, they may not look like this, but who aren't fully indoctrinated into this way of thinking, this critical theory, you know, ultimately based on Marxism kind of thinking. So she knows what your problem is. If I go to therapy and I say I'm depressed, she'll say, oh, well, you're depressed because patriarchy puts these standards on you that are unnatural. You know, they're just social constructions. And you feel like you need to live up to these socially constructed standards, these values. Uh, and that's why you're depressed. She would say the same thing to a woman, of course. You're being oppressed by the patriarchy uh, or white supremacy. You know, if you're white, you you feel like, like, yeah, you have this unearned power just because you're white. Or if you're black or a person of color, then you are oppressed by this white supremacy. You know, this idea that society is run by white people. So part of your therapy is going to be, you know, trying to undo any kind of uh, social programming you've gone through, doing away with that. And, uh, you know, part of the therapy is activism. And they're, they're quite explicit about this. Part of the therapy is activism. So maybe what you need to do is throw over society. So anyways, what I'm trying to say is she has the answers. You have problems. She has the answers. Now, she's going to warm you up. I, I don't know if that's her intention. I shouldn't say that. But she's going to not go there right away. She's going to hold space. You know, I went to a school who is very, uh, you know, heavy into critical race theory. But I wasn't taught to practice that explicitly in therapy. I was taught to do the validation, Carl Rogers, infant positive regard, hold space, you know, hold space for the person. But ultimately, we know why you're here. We know what the problem is. So she knows your values. She knows your values before she even meets you. And people are pushing back against this and saying you don't go to therapy to achieve certain values. You go to therapy to develop your own th values or, or yeah, whatever you think you need to do. That's not really why I'm, I'm doing this presentation because of uh, people like them doing this presentation because I received some questions from a listener. What do I mean by mutually beneficial? He asked, why does it need to be mutually beneficial? By mutually beneficial, I refer to my emotional diagram. So uh, let me move my face over here. Let's get as far away as I can. Okay. Maybe there. So how do you manage your anger? Well, anger is caused by a need or injustice. It comes in, you feel anger, and ultimately what you need to do to manage this anger is to get that need or injustice met, or to rectify that injustice, get that need met. Again, we got to distinguish between healthy needs and unhealthy needs. We'll get to it. And you've got to do it in a mutually beneficial way. You can't do it by hurting other people. You don't have to help other people necessarily, but that's usually the best way to do it and the easiest way. But at least not hurt anybody when you get your name at, right? It needs to be mutually beneficial. I say that here. Well, benefit implies value. It does. So to whose benefit? How do we determine these values that are so-called mutual? You know, same thing with anxiety. A threat or loss comes in, causes anxiety. So how do we manage this anxiety ultimately to get confidence? Well, you got to look at what the threat or loss ultimately is. Discern that very well. And then you need to confront that threat in a mutually beneficial way. Again, benefit implies value. So that's what his questions are. So why does it need to be mutually beneficial to manage these emotions based on what criteria, whose judgment of what's beneficial and does this need to be objective? Is subjective good enough? And if it is objective, is, yeah, is it okay for it to be, or yeah, if it is objective, how do we determine what's objective? What if 
you think that the what you're doing to, let's say, manage your anger is mutually beneficial, but it turns out that it's not. Does that help you manage the anger? Does, does that help you transform the anger into one I will just call compassion, a feeling of compassion? So that's the question here. So some examples that I've, you know, um, experienced firsthand in, in the clinic, you know, just hearing uh, clients talk. So if you go to negotiate a salary increase, you, you want more money. That's a need that you have. You, you Okay, so do you... Um, is this the right thing to do? Because you're taking money away from the company. Is that a, a, a healthy way of getting your needs met? And, and by the way, I'm just bringing up these examples. I'm not going to answer them now. But I'm kind of opening a loop. I'm bringing up these examples. We're going to talk about the foundations for this stuff. And then we'll go back and answer these based on what I think the foundation of, of a healthier ethic would be, could possibly be. Same thing when you need to go talk to a girl. Oh, you see this girl and she looks, you know, uh, attractive. You want to get to know her. Oh, but, you know, she's walking down the street. She has sunglasses on and she has earbuds in. Uh, if I if I talk to her, then I will just interrupt her. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I'm confronting a potential loss. I'm confronting a threat or what I perceive to be a threat. But it's going to hurt her because it's going to disrupt her. Ethical dilemma, we could say. Or if you cut off a friend or break up with a girlfriend. Same kind of thing. Uh, I, you know, this friend is no good for me. He's a... Uh, Spoken a lot of pot or, yeah, this girlfriend's going nowhere. But if I break up with her, it's going to hurt her. Because maybe you project out, well, I'm all that she has and it's going to hurt her. So what do I do here? Does getting my needs met, does confronting threats, does that involve hurting people? Well, that's not mutually beneficial, is it? We'll talk about it. And when you talk with your mom, you know, I, I think it's generally, not, not all the time, but generally healthy to create a better relationship with your mom. Of course, as I say here, the best possible relationship with your mom that you could create. Uh, but, right, well, this could entail some hurt. Your mom could start to cry because a better relationship with your mom means she knows more about you. And, of course, the more your mom knows about you, the more she cries. So, yeah, in a way, I'm confronting a threat and I'm getting a so-called need met. But if it hurts my mom, if she cries, well, how's that ethical? Revenge theft. So if you break up with a girlfriend and she leaves something over at your place, but she hurt you. And so you, you would return it because it's hers, but she hurt you. So you deserve to have it. I don't know what it is, like a Netflix subscription, uh, whatever. You, you, you continue to use her Netflix account. So Something that you see, I don't know. Um, I've actually never <laughs> encountered that ethical dilemma in therapy. I just was trying to think of more. And then suicide bomber. I've never encountered somebody who's a potential suicide bomber in therapy. Yeah, well, we'll see. But, you know, if you look at from a suicide bomber's perspective, what he's doing is correct, right? He he has this worldview that says these people who are heathens or infidels, you know, let's be honest, they're infidels. Uh, they don't, you know, them being alive in this state of being an infidel is bad for them. So if I kill them, it's ultimately good. It's good for me because I'm going to elevate myself. I'm going to go to a higher realm and maybe honor my family, do a bunch of other things. So from a suicide bomber's perspective, blowing himself up at, at a marketplace somewhere in Lebanon, that is mutually beneficial. So how do we deal with something like that? So again, we're just opening the loop. I'm going to talk about some issues here and then come back to these examples and, and let you know what I think is going on here and how to discern ethical situations from a better perspective. And that's really all I'm going for here. So one caveat is I, I'm not, this presentation, you know, it, it's just my thoughts at the very least. This is how I derive values. This is how I look at ethical situations. I am not good enough of a person. I am not smart enough of a person to lay out some generalized view of, of ethics. I don't care enough to do that because ultimately I've never encountered, and this is another indication of, I think, what my answer is going to be here. I've never encountered a situation in the clinic where an, an ethical dilemma that we can't figure out through 30 seconds, maybe a minute of questioning, of just back and forth question, you know, just to figure out what's going on. Ethical dilemmas do not exist in the clinic. And of course, that's the thing with therapy and why I don't really talk about philosophy too much. 
when it comes to therapy. And why I didn't really feel like I needed to leave this into my book when I was discussing what mutually beneficial is because people don't go to therapy to learn what they need to do. Right? They don't go to therapy because there's some ethical dilemma. They go to therapy because they know what the answer is. They know what they need to do, but because of unconscious reasons, reasons anxiety, self-sabotage, self-doubt, shame, these things come up and they find themselves not being able to do the thing that they know they need to do or they can't do it consistently enough. So we go to therapy to figure out that unconscious issue. Ultimately, I mean, if you're a good therapist, that's what you do. So, yeah, ultimately, I, th- I think there's a simple answers in therapy, which, again, indicates the resolution to this discrepancy. All right, so let's talk about it. Part two, philosophical background for this debate, this issue. So where do values come from? Well, there's been two sides to this throughout the history of philosophy. You go... go uh, watch my dim hypothesis presentation that I did a few months ago that goes more into this. There's two sides of this, the D and the M, the disintegrated D and the misintegrated M. Think of the D as uh, Democrats, M as Republicans, D as, from a, a metaphysical perspective, materialism, M as idealism, from an epistemological perspective, D is empiricism, M as rationalism. Um, D would say values don't exist, or we can't look at the facts of reality and derive values from the facts. Values come from something else, maybe from others. This is where you find people doing some utilitarian calculation to find out what's the right thing to do. Uh, You know, ultimately, D values, um, it's not based on anything, but you can't live without values, so you end up coming up with some kind of values if you say there's no epistemological metaphysical foundation for human values. Utilitarianism being one of those iterations. Uh, You know, people just say, well, do what you feel is right. You know, whatever you feel is right or, or whatever is socially acceptable, do that. Or whatever is beneficial to you and your family politically, that's the right thing to do. You know, sophistry. The M would say, oh, there are definite values, but they don't come from reality. They come from on high. They come from some supernatural realm. And this is where we get religious values, Christianity and Marxism. You know, the the pink haired therapist lady who I showed there. I mean, she she has a very D heavy metaphysical view and epistemology. Of course, she doesn't know what metaphysics and epistemology is. I mean, she's a Marxist. And of course, she hasn't read a word of Marxist of Marx of Marxist thought. Uh, Maybe she has actually. Uh, but not from the horse's mouth. But you find Marxists having very strict religious kind of values. So you're like, where does this come from? Well, because, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. And when you say epistemologically, metaphysically, there's no foundation for human values. It, it just You can't live on doubt. And crazy values just come in, like an eruption from the unconscious ultimately. So this is the two sides of the debate. But then there's a third way. And that third way, again, and go back to my dim hypothesis presentation to, to learn more about the, this uh, trifecta way of thinking about epistemological issues. The third way is an integrated way. That would say values come from nature or who we are and what we need to do to, to grow and live a healthy life is based on what we are. So what I'm talking about here is the is ought dichotomy. So the you know enlightenment did did, it did a lot. I mean I I love enlightenment thought. Like we cannot have civilization the way that it is now without it. But there was the seed of its own destruction. And what the enlightenment did and the Renaissance uh, philosophy did to some degree is it turned away from nature. I mean it really started with Aquinas. I would argue. That's that's what I've learned, and I think it's true. I mean, this isn't my original point. It really started with Aquinas, and what Aquinas did is he started to give arguments for the existence of God. It never would have happened before. You know, you argument for God? What are you talking about? It's just faith. There is no argument. But now he's trying to justify it. And now he starts to look at other arguments and go, hmm, there's this thing called reality out there. Let's Let's turn to reality. And try to investigate that. So this is where we get empiricism, uh, the scientific method, beginnings of of induction, 
well, not the beginnings of induction were with Aristotle, but more induction. Uh, but the problem with that is we didn't get enough conceptualization to give us values because values are concepts. So if we just look at the is, how do we de derive an ought from an is? How do we derive what we should do based on what we are? That's Hume's law, and he was like the, the end point of the um, Renaissance Enlightenment thinking thought. And then the next philosopher to, to answer that was Kant, who, you know, heavy dose of religious kind of uh, values in philosophy. And that was Kant's point, right? He, he wanted to legitimize his religion, which was Christianity. So values somehow exist, but they're somehow above nature. Uh, but the third way is values come from nat nature. Who we are is based on what we are. I guess I'm kind of saying the same thing. And my, you know, four most influential philosophers here are Aristotle, Nietzsche, Jung, and Rand. You could look at Jung as a um, clarification of Nietzsche, Rand as a clarification uh, of Aristotle, and that's where I'm going to get some of these values from. Uh, so just look at an example of, of this happening. And how we do this naturally, without much thought, which is why, you know, what I said before, I think, think the ultimate ethical dilemma isn't that we have ethical dilemmas, but it's coming up with generalized <laughs> laws uh, by which we develop our ethics. How do we put that in, in a certain way? And again, I'm not doing that in this presentation. I am not smart enough. I don't care. I really don't care. Um... Because I ultimately don't think it'll matter until you go to therapy and start talking through these. Again, another indication to my resolution here to this issue. But we look at gorillas, right? I know I brought this up, but how do we set up a gorilla's habitat in the zoo? Right? How do we do that? Well, we base it on the nature of the gorilla. We observe how gorillas behave. We observe their group dynamics. And we put, you know, we're not going to put two uh, two gorillas who are going to fight, let's say, in the same area, because it's just going to lead to uh, big, big problems. So that's how we set up gorilla habitats in the zoo. We look at their nature. Okay, this is how gorillas operate. So based on how they operate, this is an ethical way, you could say, to set up their environment in a zoo. Uh, same thing with parenting. Like any parenting book worth its weight, what does it base its parenting dictums on well hopefully it'll look at what the nature of the child is and a parenting book for a three-year-old is going to be different than a parenting book for a seven-year-old because they have they are two completely different stages of their development uh they have com uh, d different biologies you know there's d different brain development that's really the difference and so you look at the difference there and okay because the three-year-old has this kind of brain development you treat them this way and because a seven-year-old has this kind of brain development you treat them this other way you know i talked about it as at the park the uh this has been spent a couple months now maybe six months and there is some uh i, I would just call him a grown boy maybe eight nine maybe ten i don't know i have a very difficult time determining the age of a, a child it's like it's somewhere between you're, you're somewhere between three and nine. I, I can't tell the difference. Um, and then the kid was crying for whatever reason. And the dad was hugging the child. I mean, the, the, this child, I mean, it's even a stretch to say that this grown child was straddling the, the father on the park bench, crying, and the, the, the dad was caressing him. And I know what's going on there is, oh, you got to, you, you know, you got to, comfort your children you know let them know they're safe well that's true maybe for a two-year-old but for an eight-year-old even for a six-year-old i would argue even a four-year-old like now they their brain has developed enough where now they can begin to comfort themselves and how how you would treat a two-year-old is different than how you would treat a seven-year-old and so this goes to the debate of when do you introduce kids to daycare uh, right it depends on their brain development it's a huge thing that a lot of people don't talk about when you know they, they criticize daycare or of course you know what kind of daycare and not all daycare is created equally so this is the same thing with man with us 
Our values are based on our nature, but of course the question remains what we're going to get to right now. What is man's nature? And I think there are three standards or three sources you could say for man's nature that this is what I use. I think, and I use these things because they are uh, just incontrovertible. We, we, they come up over and over again. And in some aspects, we can't even have the discussion of what is man's nature or of ethics without these standards. So the first one is the Oedipus complex. The second one is individuation. And the third one is consciousness. What is the nature of our consciousness? Excuse me. You have some coffee there. And again, I'm not going to pretend this is definitive. I don't care enough, but this is just how I derive values. Yeah, I guess you could say the first two delineate man's nature in some fundamental way. And then without consciousness, without consciousness and reason, the way that I'm going to talk about reason here, we can't have the, a basis for this discussion in the first place. So we'll get to it. So what, what do I mean by Oedipus complex? Of course, I don't mean you want to literally kill your father and marry your mother. Metaphorically, I mean that, not literally. What I'm talking about here is sexual dimorphism. Humans are a sexually dimorphic species, and, and this indicates everything about what is going to be healthy for us. What is a healthy way to interact with other humans? based on our level of sexual dimorphism. This is going to tell us what we care about to some degree. Not, not the exact iteration of it. We'll get to that with individuation and consciousness. But So this, is, in a sense, tells us that status is important to developing some kind of status. And this, this of course, depends on your gender, but uh, just to varying degrees. But status, how we exercise power within a group, how helpful we can be, how we can communicate that helpfulness to others, how much money we have in a sense, and then attractiveness, how we can attract mates, develop relationships. That's going to matter and it could be an important part of our survival based on, you know, based on our sexual dimorphism, which is about 15 or 20 percent, you know, not like a gorilla to go back to that example, which is 50 percent. I mean, they have these things too, but because of that, the status is going to matter a lot more. <laughs> than the attractiveness, which I think is part of the reason why we have such large brains in the first place. And by attractiveness, I don't mean like just how hot you are. I just mean your ability. That's not the right word. It should really be relationships. And relationships is dependent on your attractiveness, how intimate you can be in a healthy way. We'll get to it. Okay, so that's a standard. And so I... You know, the way the SJW therapist, when you come to the clinic, she knows that what you ultimately need to do is over through the hierarchy. I would say what you ultimately need is a status, a sense of control in your life, a sense of helping others in a sense, and relationships. Somebody to share that life with. I, I know those are two fundamental values for you based on who you are. Okay, and then the, the second standard is, is individuation explicated by or described uh, started, you know, that this idea was started by Jung, you could argue, but explicated more by Campbell in the hero's journey that there is a, a pattern of our development as indicated by the fact that different stories across different cultures about different times have very similar patterns. What does that tell us? That tell us is that there's an archetypal way through which we're going to grow psychologically. To put it in a story structure way, before there's a new world there, there's an old world. Then there's a new world that's represented by a new challenge, a new idea. Then there's the outer challenge. How do we conquer this challenge? Like uh, if you're learning karate, you got to learn the, uh, the precise techniques, the kicking or punching techniques. That would be the outer challenge, the existential part of that challenge. Then there's the inner challenge. How... Do you uh, discipline yourself to only use karate in self-defense or, you know, be discerning, right? Or uh, developing the discipline, let's say, to show up to karate every practice and not just say, oh, I'm, I'm going to not go today. I'm just going to eat some uh, Cheetos. And then there's the aspect of, okay, you've learned this outer and inner challenge of karate. And karate is just an example, right? It could be anything. But you have this outer and inner challenge of karate. How do you give this uh, knowledge? How do you bestow this knowledge on the next generation? Whether with your children or you go to teach karate or just, yeah. 
you take what you learn in karate and bring it somewhere else. I don't know. And of course, the way that I explicate this is separation from your parents. You need to develop some kind of work and friendships. Can you be around friends without using them or being used by them? Uh, how comfortable are you with your sexuality? Can you express your sexuality in a healthy, socially acceptable way? Talk more about that. Emotion, how do you connect emotionally? And then how do you bestow what you've learned throughout your life onto the next generation? And then consciousness. What I and by this I mean, you know, not just not only man has a consciousness, so you know, gorillas have a consciousness, dogs clearly have some kind of consciousness, but but what makes ours different is reason and is cultivation. And by reason I just mean you know, the enlightenment uh version of what that means. Like we have a mind in here, there's a reality out there, and it's our job to use our mind to figure out what's going on in reality. We can't have an argument. We can't have debates about this. We can't have debates about values and what's subjective or what's subjective without that premise. Without that, then any argument about values, if we can't use our minds to figure things out, well, then what's the point of even arguing about anything? Um, people say that, you know, well, you know, reason subjective or. They say that all the time, but they don't understand the grave implications of what that would mean if that is true. It's not true. Because if you say that reason is subjective or the way that you view reality is totally subjective, well, then that claim of that it's totally subjective, I don't, that is subjective in itself. So I don't have to take that seriously, right? It, this is a reaffirmation through denial. You cannot deny the existence of a certain concept without affirming it. Reformation through denial, as Aristotle would say. So then, and also free will exists to some extent. I mean, just the the argument of values implies that we can choose some values over others. And if you can't choose values over others, then what's the point of even having an ethical debate in the first place? Also, our consciousness is heavily dependent on relationships because you don't explain. Um, I I think there's a bunch of reasons why we have the larger brains that we do have. But you cannot explain, to some degree, our large brains without relationships. We develop these brains to relate with each other. And of course, you just see this over and over again. You do not become fully aware of yourself without relating with other people in a healthy way. It's just not going to happen for you. We're going to talk more about that with, with intention here in the psychology aspect of these values. And then the ultimate goal of your consciousness is to develop a self. And that the foundations for developing an, a self, a capital S self, that's, you can look for that in my book. That's, so my book in this, in this presentation is just that little side note there. Okay, so what am I saying here? And just as a summary, values exist and we need to achieve these values to live and we are capable of this achievement and we do it in the agreement with others. We do this achievement of values in agreement with others without violating any of these standards, right? Without violating uh, their growth, their their path individuation. I mean, obviously we're not going to violate. They're a bit complex. They're, but also without violating their consciousness, without uh, violating their their own reason, their own grasp of reality, their, without interfering with their the exercise of their own free will. Even if you think that somebody may live better because they listen to you, it, it doesn't matter because by free will, me, we mean your own will. So without violation of any of these values, we come in agreement with others. And this allows us, when we do this process, it allows us to construct a self with which the achievement of values we need to live will become more efficient. So the more we are able to construct a self, the more we're able to regulate our emotions, to develop a strong boundary, we will become more efficient in the achievement of our values. Or the same effort will give us more outcome. But this is only philosophy. Right? These are standards. That's why I call them standards, because they're standards that we cannot violate. But how do we apply these standards? 
question remains, how do we determine the specifics? And I think to do that, now we start to look at psychology. So let's look at the intention, which is what psychology is. And ultimately, this is another way to derive these values, the standards that I laid out before. The sexual dimorphism, you know, status, relationship, individuation, and your consciousness. But it's also a way to apply those standards. So psychology is intention, right? It's um, not what, as I said before, we don't go to therapy because of a ethical dilemma. Coffee break, one second. We go to therapy because we know what is the right thing to do, but we can't bring ourselves to do it. So the connection here is when we manage our issues, the what, what we need to do gradually emerges, in fact. And this is, I found this to be 100% true, which is what we would expect based on our nature. I mean, if there is indeed uh, an archetypal way that we grow, an archetypal path to individuation that we all need to go through in various aspects of our lives. There's an overall aspect, that's my adult stages of development, but if there is indeed an archetypal path in which we grow, then the more we manage our anxiety and self-doubt and uh, self-sabotage and shame, you know, all those things that block us from doing what we need to do, then it would make sense that we will just gradually begin to act in a way that is beneficial, that is healthy. And now here's the section on healthy needs versus unhealthy needs. So one way of looking at what your needs are, when I when I say, okay, uh, an unmet need causes anger, uh, one way to determine how healthy that need is, is to look at whether you, you need that need, you need, yeah, whether that need is important to you because it's what you want, it's what you want for no other reason than you want it, or you just want it to cover up some insecurity you have, right? Classic example that I bring up all the time is you want a girlfriend because your friends uh, call you a homo for not having a girlfriend or, and so you don't want them to make fun of you anymore, or do you want a girlfriend because this is somebody who you can connect with, which is part of your nature. We needed to connect with others in order to grow. You can grow, grow more than you could without her. She'll grow more than she could without you you know, uh, greater than some of its parts, one plus one equals 11 kind of situation. So when it comes to rational, healthy values versus irrational, unhealthy values, irrationality, one way to describe what we'd say irrational values, which is what Ayn Rand would talk about. Uh, you know, I, I think there's like, um, uh, periods of, of brilliance in Ayn Rand's philosophy. But, but it's clear she just didn't understand psychology, you know, which is fine. I, you know, I think people rag on her all the time for that. But she, a lot of uh, psychologists or a lot of philosophers don't understand psychology. So she would just call it a rational value. But one way of looking at a rational value is it is the outcome. It is solely at the outcome of the discrepancy here. Of, of the, and a rational value is irrational to the extent that you use it to cover up pain as opposed to pursue pleasure. So a clear psyche will lead to, or clarity in your psyche, clarity in your emotional issues will lead to clarity in your ethical precepts. And this is, makes sense, as I said, because individuation is archetypal. So one way that we could look at sacrifice is unethical. Um, what am I saying here? Yeah, I'm just going to go to this side. Yeah, so one way to objectify values is, yeah, we manage our anxiety. We look at our patterns that emerge when we're in therapy and then define what psychological health must be based on the standards above. And then we just do what is the next thing, what the next thing that comes to us as long as it, of course, doesn't violate the three standards. And if you manage your anxiety well enough, you, you won't come even close to violating those three standards. So I guess what I'm trying to say here in this previous slide, sacrifice is unethical. You know, people talk about uh, brainwashing, religious kind of brainwashing. I'm not just talking about religion. I'm, I'm talking about any iteration of religion, uh, you know, lowercase r religion, like Marxism, like the pink haired therapist lady. And we think um, if we learn 
maybe unhealthy values, we would say, in uh, somehow, whether it's in college or Sunday school, that you need to sacrifice for some god or unknown realm or sacrifice for others or sacrifice others to yourself, do the narcissistic thing. We think that we learn these things as beliefs. And, and so a, a way to unlearn these things is to learn the opposite belief. But that is totally untrue. Right, and what I think really happens here, and this, I guess, why I had this slide here is because it explicates this point: is we may have learned these things. Like, like you may have learned that, you know, growing up, if your name's Seth and your parents listen to NPR, you, you may have learned that that you have some inherent guilt because of the, your skin color, because of you know your whiteness. Let's say, but I would argue that you latch onto that because of unmanaged anxiety. And so to clear up that belief or to disabuse somebody of that belief, you know, just like you disabuse somebody of unethical, ultimately, or, or hurtful religious beliefs, you know, there's something, of course, wrong with religion. It's like, you know, it's like to say something's wrong with religion. It's like saying something's wrong with a relationship, that there's nothing wrong with a relationship. It's, it's, it's how you interact in this relationship. It's how healthy are your interactions in this relationship. Same thing with religion. It's not the religion. It's how healthy is your interaction with this thing out there that we all ultimately need to varying degrees and with varying epistemologies, which I talk about in my toxic theology video. Go, go listen to that to learn more. What I'm saying here is I have, in, in my therapy and what I've done, I have seen people go through profound. Yeah, I guess this is a better way of saying it. For, forget what I've been yabbering about for the past two minutes. I have found uh, profound religious transformations within the clinic with people, yet I never talk about religion because I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a theologian. I'm a therapist. I talk about emotions. Yet people go through profound religious transformations and they create a much, they either leave the religion or go to something else or, or they, it, usually it's not that. It's just I'm going to create a healthy relationship with this religion. If there is indeed a health, an unhealthy relationship. And I never talk about religion. Well, how is that? Because we, we don't latch on to these things clearly because there are beliefs. Well, in a way, that is true, but we latch on to these things because we have an emotional attachment. Because our our belief that we need to sacrifice for others or sacrifice for God or some unknown realm or not accept our sexuality in a healthy way, this is based on unmanaged emotions. When we clear up those emotions, and this is just another indication that healthier beliefs will um, will emerge. So this is one way to objectify values. I'm just kind of saying the same thing. Connection versus sacrifice. Um, yeah, I'm just talking about the importance of connection here. I don't know. Is this... Oh yeah. Okay. So, so, okay. <laughs> this is where I'm going. It's been a while since I looked at these slides. I think some of those were a little superfluous, but okay. So the point is, is we have those three standards, the three philosophical standards of the, uh, dimorphism, your two fundamental value status and relationships. And we have, uh, what are they? Individuation. You're going to develop in a certain way. Then we have consciousness. So those standards are there. Do not violate those standards at all. Because that would violate the nature of what man is. Nature of what you are and nature of what other people are. But that's not really clear. So a way to bring clarity to this is to improve our intention. To prove our, inten our intention around each scenario. And we do this in three different ways. We manage our issues around the situation. We look at our anger and anxiety. And by manage... I mean, talk through our anger and anxiety in a certain way. And then we simply talk about the specific situation that that we may, may feel some indecision or some ethical dilemma about. We just talk about it and are really, you don't even have to talk about the situation. Let me just take this out. There's really two things. Uh this is why I say this is not definitive. I'm editing these slides as I go. So you manage your issues around each situation, and then you just look for clarity. The next step. 
Not even the next right step. We're not even there. Before we get to the next right step, Frozen 2, we got to get to the next step. And we need clarity on that. And it's clarity, not omniscience. We're not looking for omniscience. That's why I say the next. Because you're not omniscient. And you never will be. To, to demand that you be omniscient and know every iteration of every decision for the next five years is anxiety. That is perfectionism. That is procrastination. That is anxiety. Okay. So now, let's revisit these examples considering the standards plus our intentions. So when you negotiate a salary increase, uh, what are you? is this a healthy value? Yeah, you're going for more status. Great. Are you violating the consciousness of other people? No, of course not. Are, are, is this part of your individuation? Yes, obviously. So now what we do is we look at any anxiety you have about money, any anxiety you have about the situation, and any anxiety you have about your boss or anger or resentment issues, and we talk through those issues in a certain way. In the way that I describe here, which well, I'll get to in the next section. But just suffice it to say, for now, you talk through these issues in a certain way, it becomes more clear. And every time you talk through your issues around the situation, there's more and more clarity or more and more managing your emotional issues, feel more grounded. You see yourself for what you are. You see the company for what you are. So your action from that psychological plinth is going to be more and more ethical. I've talked to a girl. Is that... Uh, Part of your archetypal values. Yes, of course, relationships. Is that a violation um, of your individuation process? No, of course not. It's, it's obviously very important to your individuation process. Does that violate your consciousness uh, or her consciousness? I guess that's the real question. Well, you could say maybe it does because you disrupt her, but you're not trying to manipulate her in any way. You're just letting your consciousness be known to her. So I, I would actually call it a, an ethical violation if you walk by a girl and you think that she's pretty and you want to get to know her because you think that she's pretty. I would actually call that an ethical violation when you don't do that. And I would even say further, it's an ethical violation to care what she thinks because what she cares is her own consciousness and up to her own free will, which is when we say free will, we could just mean individual will. So you were there thinking about what she's thinking. That's a violation of her. That's disrespectful to her. You care about what she's going to think about you approaching her or whether she's going to say yes or no. That's her business, not yours. So that's actually an ethical violation. If you see a girl you want to talk to, you don't talk to her. Um... I know you probably don't feel that because of your anxiety, but once you manage these issues, it's, I mean, that's where I want to get guys with girls like, um, you know, like, like the, the emotional sensitivity or spiritual sensitivity, right? Like I talked about a couple weeks ago in a video, uh, I want to get, you know, so, so how do you get guys to stop lying? And, you know, very few people are pathological liars, but lying is a little boy thing that we all do and we all need to do away with at some point you know just lie a little pretty little bit of uh, you know squirming weaseling our way out of things here and there oh if we get we're not going to lie but if we get caught we're going to lie to get out of trouble this is little boy behaviors which by the way is totally healthy for a little boy to do but i know i don't have to talk to you in therapy about oh it's important to tell the truth i, I would write like i criticized jordan pearson i would never write a book that says oh the importance of telling the truth it doesn't matter but what we do is in therapy we manage your anxiety we manage your shame we manage maybe some self-sabotage issues that you have perhaps caused by the shame then when you go to lie and you will still lie you'll do it but you're gonna be more sensitive to it you're gonna go oh that that kind of makes me sick to my stomach when it, when I lie because I see what I'm doing, right? I see what I do. I see how it affects my life. I see how it reflects my relationships. Like every lie you tell, it just reverberates throughout reality. You can feel it. So now, next time when you put in a situation where you typically would have lied, guess what? 
you're going to be a lot less likely to lie. And it's not going to come from any finger wagging. Oh, you should lie. It's not healthy. Because it's not true to your consciousness. It's not true to reality. It's you're manipulating other people. That is a violation of an ethical standard. Of course, there's obviously some situations where you do lie. You know, it's, it's, this is all context dependent, right? That's why there are these standards, but then there's a way to apply these standards through psychology, through understanding your intention. Like, you know, obviously Nazis come to the door, you have Anne Frank in the attic, you lie. So that's one example. Same thing when you cut off a friend or break up with your girlfriend. Oh, this is going to hurt them. Oh, see, now we can see a lot more clearly that's unethical because you care about what their consciousness is. Right? You're, you're trying to manage their consciousness through your decisions. But if they're an adult, by the way, these ethical standards are just for adults, obviously. With children, it's different, you know, based on different contexts, of course. Uh, so with an adult, oh, you care about their consciousness? Oh, that's... So then we have to look at your intention. Why do you care? And usually when we start looking at the intention and start talking about issues, start to manage your emotions around talking with your mom, for example, or breaking up with a girlfriend, you see, oh, I care because I have anxiety issues. It makes me anxious to make other people upset, even though it's the truth. Okay, that's your anxiety then. Same thing with connecting with your mom. Revenge theft, this is more of a faking I would say of of consciousness, a, fa a faking of reality, and, and ultimately in, in these kinds of situations, not that I've, I've actually come across this situation, but when it comes to confronting an ex about something, it's more about you being afraid of talking with them. That's really why you don't want to bring up the fact that you still have their Netflix password. You just don't want to talk with them about it you don't want to talk with them of anything and maybe it's based on insecurity because uh, because you feel like you may, you may get wrapped up in this relationship again if you even see them oh okay so that's your insecurity issues maybe that's your validation issues coming up and so when we, yes so if it is your validation issue coming up which usually it would be in this situation then we manage your validation issue you know we look at more fundamental needs uh needs that you have because you you have them for no other reason because you want to pursue them to increase pleasure rather than to avoid pain and then we can see oh well, you have a difficult time getting needs met in other areas of your life in other relationships that are more fundamental than this ex-girlfriend and that's why you have the issue oh okay a lot of clarity there and then suicide bomber this is obviously going to be a violation of uh all the standards <laughs> Uh, all the value standards, the, the value standards without which we can't even have ethics in the first place. And we can't even talk about choosing one ethical code as opposed to another. And then, um, I would imagine, you know, it's some kind of sacrifice and I haven't talked to a suicide bomber or dealt one sp with specifically in the clinic, but this is probably a lot of anxiety here. <laughs> I would imagine. I mean, that that's, uh, yeah, suicide is the ultimate self-sabotage. So, probably a lot of shame. Right? So you have these values and then, or these standards, and then you iterate them through developing, through developing a clear intention, which you do by talking about your issues, talking through your emotions in a healthy way. And then from there, I'm, I'm giving you a basis for an ethical code based on these standards, but then you arrive at your own through iteration, through intention, which re requires, which re require, of course, that you mess up. It's okay to mess up. It's okay to think you're doing something right. And then if you realize on reflection that it wasn't right, it was the wrong thing, then, then we have this thing called apology. <laughs> you go and apologize to somebody. And as I talk about in a, their program, there's a difference between an apology and an amend, right? An apology is you just say you're sorry and you own your part. An amend is you actually go further and talk about how your emotional issues played into you acting in an incorrect way here. All right, so practice. I got I kind of just started to practice. But okay, so you learn the what, you learn the standards, and then you manage your emotional issues. You manage your intention in a sense to develop the why in the how. So how do you learn the what? Well, just general you need more um, either education. You got to learn more about a situation. So if you're going and asking for a pay raise, just maybe you, honestly, like it's like sometimes this wouldn't be therapy 
technically at this point, maybe you just le- need to learn more about uh, what what is a healthy way or or when to ask for a pay increase. Right? Or, or again, maybe if you feel anxiety about starting a business, maybe you just need to learn how to start a business. I mean, you know, I, I've got some business books here that I recommend. One is about like a business model generation. The one's about, the other is about um, being a rational. It's called the new rational manager or something like that. And it, it basically describes how Amazon's run. It, it doesn't matter. We don't have to get into that now. But um, it's not about Amazon. I think the book came out before Amazon, but Amazon I, it maybe didn't include the practices of that book. But it's just about you know, you know creating like a more organic structure for your company, whatever I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. And so if you feel aimless in something, that's why it's in parentheses there. Then you may need more education. If you feel stuck, maybe you just need more experience. Maybe you need to mess up a few times. And if you do mess up, uh, which hopefully when you mess up, you don't violate any of the, the three standards too much. But if you do, then right. That's why we have apology and apologies, well, not apologies so much, but amends are just great for bringing awareness. Hey, here, here's where I messed up. And apology is getting a bad name because, you know, <laughs> I'm walking into a coffee shop and some Gen Z is walking out the door as I'm walking in and he goes, oh, sorry. And he steps aside, right? Not because I'm this uh, huge alpha presence. I, I like to think I am, but I know that's not the reason. It's it's because of his anxiety. So so apologies become of uh, the, this uh, upchuck, this anxiety upchuck. So uh, apologies have been kind of given a bad name because of that. But um, no, it's just really healthy to apologize when you realize, oh, I messed up here. So you learn the what through education and experience, then you practice by managing your issues. By that, I just mean talking through your anxiety at the very beginning. Just talk through anxiety, talk through anger, and you do this in a certain way. And so what do I mean by that? Well, let's just use anger as an example, right? The need or injustice comes in. Is this cursor showing up? We'll see. The need or injustice comes in and you feel anger. So name the feeling. Talk about the anger. Don't just say anger. I mean, you can say anger if that's how you really feel, but put it in your own words. These are general words. Anger and anxiety, these are general words, but it, for, for self-awareness, and especially for connecting with others and really understanding these issues, you got to put it in your own words. What do you really feel? Then you ask yourself why you feel it, and this brings up any unconscious issues that we have around anger. Not just about the situation, but... This situation happened and I feel anger and this reminds me of this situation or this reminds me of some unmanaged anger issue I have in some other situation. You know, when you're asking yourself why you feel a certain way, ask yourself, what does it mean to you that you feel this way? We're just bringing clarity. We're getting more and more clarity with our unconscious. And then you talk about your responsibility and you don't just say, Oh, I'm, I'm responsible because that's what Jocko Willing tells me to do. I, I, cause I, you know, I know from Twitter, that it's important to be responsible. I read a thread about it. No, you, you get clear to, in order to talk about your responsibility in a certain way, in a healthy way, ultimately, you got to get clear on what your fundamental pattern is and how your fundamental pattern plays out in this one specific situation. And, and you may not be responsible for the need or injustice that comes in. Maybe not. Especially when you're a child, you weren't. But now, that the anger is yours, the anger, your emotion, is your responsibility. Got to get clear on what that is. And that's what we'll do in therapy. And then once once you take responsibility, then how to manage it. I don't even have guys talk about what they, what they need to do to manage it because it's so obvious. Once you get clear with the why and what it means and your responsibility, what to do, how to assert this anger, how to play, have this anger that you have. And you put it out in the environment in a healthy way. It doesn't violate any standards and you clarify your intention. And that'll show you the next thing. That's how you do it. Same thing. With and you know and and each level that I talk about there you know that's a different level I mean some guys you know you come into therapy and I mean forget talking about emotions I'm talking about emotions that's difficult like, just just tell me what happened just tell me what's going on in your life tell me the situation 
sometimes that's enough of a challenge. Let's just start there. Then when you get comfortable, just talking to somebody about what's going on in your life, which for a lot of guys, and you know, women too, but but guys, you know, just don't don't even talk about what's going on. Yeah, you have a difficult ac- accessing your emotions. Yeah, you don't even know what's going on. You can't even get the first step. Then once you get comfortable with that, then you can start talking about the emotion. Just tell me what you feel. Name one feeling. Let's just start there. Now we get better at that. Okay, now we can talk about why you have that feeling, what it means. We get more clarity on that as we talk through your past and really, you know, put the patterns together or put the pieces together to create a pattern for you. And then talk about the responsibility becomes easier and easier. And then all this happens in an instant, all this talking down here, and then just what you need to do can become obvious with enough practice. So in sum, what am I saying here to go back to the first couple of slides? Yeah, to the question of do we receive wisdom from the therapist or do we develop our own wisdom? Well, the answer here, you know, both right, both wrong. The therapist doesn't know your precise values, but he does know your nature. So preferably, he guides you through a more thorough understanding of who you are so you can make a more informed decision, which necessitates reason, your free will, and so your sense of self, which necessitates the building of those things. And this will bring you to a more clear next step And with a more clear next step, a next correct step, a next right step, uh, an ethical code will begin to emerge and become more solidified. Then you can really uh, integrate. Then you're fully ready to fully integrate the lessons, the wisdom of Frozen 2. All right, guys. So if you want to know more about the foundations of psychology or foundations of a capitalist self, go get my book, animusempire.com slash book. There's a link there to the Amazon page. That's all it really is. You can get a paperback, Kindle, and an audio book. And of course, we do free consultations, animusempire.com slash schedule. Thank you, guys. And I wish you all the joy and all the pain that comes from... Uh, partaking in the process of discerning your own ethical code.